And now we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 3. We'll start in verse 14. We'll read through the end of the chapter, which is verse 22. This is the seventh of the seven letters of Jesus to the churches in Revelation. We started back in chapter 1 where Jesus reveals himself to John in this great glorious image, this great glorious vision which has all this language of the Old Testament identifying himself as the powerful, glorious God. And then, of course, the risen one as well, the one who was dead and then is alive. And as the one who has authority, he addresses through the pen of the Apostle John these seven letters. We come to the final one, to the church in Laodicea, and that comes to us from Revelation 3 again, verses 14 to 22. Before we read these words of Scripture, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, You have given Your Word by inspiration through Your Holy Spirit, and we know that all Scripture is God-breathed. And we come to these, we come to these words, we know that they are God-breathed and that, and that they are Christ-commanded. That here as we read these words, we read precise words instructed to Your servant John, given to this church for their purpose, but as well spoken by the Spirit to us. So give us ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, as the Lord says, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Revelation 3, starting in verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered. And I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your, uh, to appoint your, to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love I reprove and discipline so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You've heard it said, I'm sure, that we save the best for last. Well, in some cases that's good, but that is certainly not what the Savior decided to do in these seven letters to the churches. Instead, it seems that Jesus saved the worst for last. To each of the other six churches, there is some kind of good news. Even if it's just implied, there's something at least implicitly positive about the church itself. But that is absolutely not the case with the Laodiceans. Nothing positive is spoken of them whatsoever. Now this is, strangely, as the most negative of the letters, also the most commonly known of the letters, and that's because of the vivid metaphor that Jesus uses of spitting them out of his mouth because they are not hot or cold. And we'll come to that in just a moment. But I want us to begin in seeing how Jesus describes himself to the Laodiceans in verse 14. So from verse 14 again, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Jesus describes himself here in three ways, and he describes himself, specifically addressing himself then to the angel of the church in Laodicea. And back towards the beginning of our time together, 
we noted that the angel of the church in Laodicea is almost certainly not a, a heavenly being like an angel, like angels we have heard on high, but it's, it's a, a messenger, and an angel was a messenger. And so this is most likely written to the, the preacher, or we might say the elders of the church in Laodicea. And again, Jesus uses three things to describe himself here. First, he says that he is the Amen. Now, we use amen as sort of a a code word. When we say amen, it means, generally speaking, that you can open your eyes because the prayer is done. But really, amen is is more than that. When we see amen in the Scriptures, it's not typically the end of a prayer. It's a word of exclamation or sort of a, a punctuation at the end of something. It means surely or may it be done or yes, this is the case. And so when Jesus calls himself the Amen, he is saying that he is the one who seals the truth of God. That because he lives, as we'll see in the next description, because he lives, all things that God says, all things that God promises are true. So he is the Amen. And then, second, he describes himself as the faithful and true witness. This is not unlike what we've seen elsewhere In these letters, Jesus describes himself as faithful and true and being a witness. And again, in this, we understand that Jesus is the ultimate witness. When we speak of Jesus, we say that he has three offices, the office of prophet, priest, and king. And Jesus, as a prophet, speaks truth. But it's not just like the other prophets, great men as they were, it's not just like the other prophets who speak what God revealed to them, but that when he speaks, he speaks as God. That when you hear his words, you hear the perfect words of God. When you see his action, you see God at work. And so he is the faithful and he is the true witness. And more than that, he is the faithful and true witness to the claims of Christianity, to the claims of the gospel and of the church. There is there's one fact, there's one truth upon which the Christian life, the Christian faith rather, entirely depends. And that truth is the resurrection. Either it is true or it is not. If it is not true, then Christianity is the greatest hoax in the history of hoaxes. If it is true, if it is true, then how could the claims of the gospel be anything but true? And so the courtroom has been in the news a lot lately, and so we can use that as a metaphor. If Christianity is on trial, if the gospel is on trial, who would be the star witness? Well, the star witness would be Christ. And if if Jesus is able to come, we might say, into the courtroom, if he presents himself as being alive, then of course the scriptures are true. The gospel is true. If the star witness can walk in having been dead and then alive, of course it's true. But if you can find his bones, of course it's all a lie. Jesus is the faithful witness. And in his appearance to John, in all of his glory, John being only the latest of the ones that he appeared to, in his appearance to John, in all of his glory, he reveals to John and through John to these churches and through John's writing and by the Holy Spirit to us that yes, he witnesses that yes, the claims of the gospel are true. Then we see third, that he is the beginning of God's creation. Now, that that doesn't mean that he's the first created thing. Far from it. Jesus is not created. He is the creator. We see that We see that in the letter to the Colossians where we read, by Him, by Jesus, all things were created. And we read earlier on in the Scriptures in John's Gospel, which strangely was written after the letter to the Colossians, It says that all things were made through Him, and without Him was nothing made that has been made. If He made everything that was made, of course, He didn't make Himself, and so He is the Maker Himself. 
And so when we read and when we see Jesus describing himself as the the beginning of the creation, he means that he is the source, that he is the origin of God's creation. And as the origin of God's creation, he speaks as one who has perfect authority. But it's more than just the original creation that is in view here. But Jesus is the beginning of the new creation as well. That with the resurrection of Jesus, the curse, Adam's curse, begins to go backwards. Because death itself unravels and begins to be defeated in the resurrection. So Jesus is the beginning of the original creation by way that he created it. He is the beginning of the new creation because it is by his power that all things are made new. And so he is the amen, he is the faithful witness, and then as well he is the one who is the beginning of God's creation. So now this this great one, what does he have to say? Does he have to say, well, he begins this letter, again dictated through the pen of the Apostle John. He says this, we'll read verses 15 and 16. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth begins with a a familiar phrase, I know your works. Well, what are they? He doesn't list any. That's the implied point. I know your works. I'm not going to talk about them at all because there aren't any to talk about. And rather than digressing into a whole bunch of works that you haven't worked at all, I'm simply going to say, I know your works, and you are going to know that he knows that there are really none. And so rather than commenting on, his, on their works, which don't exist, he goes into this metaphor, which is very common for us, it, it is well known to us, which is that he desires for them to be either hot or cold. There are a couple of different interpretations of this. I think the one that is most commonly given, at least among our own, our own people in our own day, is that Jesus wants them either on fire for him or not to be believers at all. Pick one or the other. It's possible, but I think it's it's generally very unlikely that Jesus would say that he would ever want anybody, there goes my bulletin, that Jesus would ever want anybody not to be a believer in the first place. Rather, the second interpretation is much better, which is that Jesus simply wants his church to have some sort of benefit particularly to be beneficial to those who are around them. I think that once we understand the water situation in Laodicea, we'll probably better understand the metaphor that Jesus is using. Other cities in the region, like Hierapolis and Colossae, had good water situations. Uh, this is uh, just a, a bit of a side note. Laodicea is very close to the letter, is very close to uh, Colossae. And so in Paul's letter to the Colossians, he tells the Colossians to send the letter on to the Laodiceans. And so Colossae is very close, and Colossae had a good, had a good water situation because they had cold springs. They're very refreshing. It was water that was good for drinking. And then on the other end of the spectrum, Hierapolis had hot springs. And it was like a hot tub, but it was really healthy for you. It was hot mineral springs. And so if you were in need of some kind of healing, oftentimes these these hot springs were very beneficial for you. Hot water and cold water have their benefits. But the water situation in Laodicea was not nearly so good. Laodicea had lukewarm water. And worse than that, if you drank much of Laodicea's lukewarm water, you would have a problem because it was very heavy in calcium carbonate. And if you drink too much calcium carbonate, you vomit. And so this lukewarm water was not only unpleasant to the taste, but it would cause serious illness. And so I think that this is a bit more vivid than we would first imagine. It's not just that Jesus takes a little drink, swishes it around, and spits it back out. It's that Jesus says, more more literally, I will barf you out. You make me sick 
These lukewarm acts, the way that you are, they make me sick to my stomach. It's vivid, isn't it? There are very few things in this life more unpleasant than vomiting, seeing, or hearing somebody else do the same. When you hear somebody that has the flu in the other room, at least when I do, and I hear something, I want to walk away. Now, that's not very good parenting if you leave your child there all by themselves, and it's even worse if it's your spouse, but that's the initial inclination. You are sick, and it sounds disgusting. I want to go away. And there are very few things that I dislike more than barfing. I I, I hate it. For the longest time, I knew that every year I was going to get the stomach flu. And I just dreaded winter. There's all kinds of reasons for dreading winter. This was at the top of my list. Now, praise the Lord, for the last three years, it hasn't happened. And I'm going to trust that the Lord is not going to smite me for having said that in front of the congregation and making it happen this year. But it's, it's incredibly vivid, and it's meant to be vivid. It is meant to have a shock factor. You are so disgusting that to me, because of your lack of works, you are profaning, you are blaspheming my name by claiming that you are my people and having actually nothing to do with me in your acts that I would rather spit you out than allow you to go on like this. And so this is, this is meant to be startling for them. It's like pouring a glass of ice water on them while they're sleeping. They're meant to wake up. There's shock value in this. And speaking of ice water then, let's turn to verse 17. Jesus goes on, he says, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. There are two kinds of people in this world. People who drink their water with ice in it and barbarians. <laughs> Note that down. We had a family emergency a couple months ago while the ice breaker, the ice maker in our freezer broke. And you know, I, I didn't realize how much I used ice. I knew that I liked ice, but I didn't realize how much ice I went through until it broke and I'm counting the precious cubes. And when the last of those precious moon-shaped cubes was gone, I knew we had a problem. And something had to change because I wasn't going to go on drinking this lukewarm, wet stuff for much longer. Something had to change, and it had to change quickly. And that's what Jesus says is the case here in Laodicea. Something has to change, and it needs to change quickly. They think everything is great. They think they're going along just fine. Things are going swimmingly, we might say. It's very, it's very pleasant But the reality is the opposite. They think things are great. Jesus says things are horrible. He uses these adjectives. Again, strong language. They are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. They were, I guess we might just say, pathetic. They thought they had everything going on. They were rich. Everything seemed to be just fine. They were rich. They belonged to the church. They were seemingly in good standing. Nothing seemed to be off in their lives. They thought things were great. Then Jesus says, you are pitiable. You are poor. You are blind. You are naked. Things are not fine. Things are not anywhere close to fine. They are are like the emperor from the emperor's new clothes. They think that they are decked out in beautiful life garments. They have wealth. They have comfort, likely ease. They have some sort of religious comfort and some sort of at least perceived piety. They think that they are beautiful, but the opposite is true. God says, in fact, that they are naked. And he says that as those who are naked, they are shameful. They were proud, where instead they should have been humble. In fact, given the words that Jesus uses, they should have been likely humiliated. And so once more, once more there is 
There's more than meets the eye. Reality is different than what is perceived. And so it is here with the Laodiceans again. This is a very common mistake. It's a common mistake. It's not unique to the Laodiceans. It's not unique to the New Testament age at all. This is the same in the days of Israel. They believed at times that they were affluent and things were going just fine. This was the, this was the case during the time of the prophet Hosea. Hosea records, the Lord speaks to Hosea, and he records how they thought everything was fine. And because they were wealthy, because things seemed to be going well, then God must be pleased. This is what they said. Ephraim, that is a representative of the northern kingdom, Ephraim has said, ah, but I am rich. I have found wealth for myself. In all my labors, they cannot find in me iniquity or sin. I am rich. Therefore, there must be no sin. But this is what the Lord says in the very next verse. I am the Lord your God from the land of Egypt. I will again make you dwell in tents as in the days of the appointed feast. You think you're rich? I'm going to send you back out into the wilderness in your tents. And in this, he simply means he's going to send them off into exile. They will be, to use the same metaphor, and the Old Testament uses it often, they will be vomited out of the land because of their sin. Just because you are comfortable or rich or because things seem to be going well, does not mean that the Lord sees it the same way. And if we simply comfort ourselves in thinking that somehow our physical comfort or our material blessings should be equated with God's favor upon us, then we are deceiving ourselves. That is not to say that wealth is in and of itself a bad thing. Far from it. Far from it. It is simply to say that wealth is not an indicator of God's favor or of God's appreciation of our lifestyle. Just because we have something does not mean that it is pleasing in God's sight. And so perhaps surprisingly, the affluence here of the Laodiceans, like in the other letters, is actually a mark against them. Because to participate in commerce, to participate in the economy of Laodicea would have meant selling out at least somewhat because they would have had to join some kind of trade guild. They would have had to at least give given lip service to the gods of Laodicea to be accepted enough to be able to actually make a profit. So that they are rich tells us that their piety was, was surface level at best. You see, the, the problem for them was that the church is supposed to be salt and light. The church is supposed to season the world. The church is supposed to illuminate. But the opposite has happened in Laodicea. Instead, the world, the world has affected the church. Instead of some in the world becoming godly, those who are godly or meant to be godly have instead become worldly. So again, the world seems to be turned upside down. Now, God would have been just fine stopping at verse 17, ending the letter and moving on, but He doesn't. He continues speaking into verse 18. That He continues speaking at this point is nothing short of a great act of mercy. That's what He says in verse 18. I counsel you to buy from Me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich in white garments that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Jesus is not going to tolerate the lethargic, apathetic Christianity of the Laodiceans. He doesn't tolerate it in our own day either. He counsels them to buy three things. First thing he counsels them to buy is purified gold. Real gold. You see, Laodicea was a very wealthy place. 
very wealthy. It was well situated. It was at the crossroads of major trade routes, and that brought money in and travelers in and all kinds of commerce. And so it was a wealthy place. And there was a certain degree of civic pride in Laodicea. They were patriotic Romans, like many of those living in Asia Minor in the day, but they were also very glad to be Laodiceans. And because there was a dignity in being a Laodicean, and so at one point, this dignity showed itself very plainly. At one point, Laodicea was leveled by an earthquake. There were lots of earthquakes in Asia Minor in those days. And so Laodicea was leveled by an earthquake. And the Roman Empire would, would offer to rebuild cities that had these natural disasters. So the empire kept the people rather glad to be part of the empire by helping them when they needed help. And the Laodiceans said, no thanks. We don't, we don't need your funds. Thank you very much, but we can do this ourselves because we are Laodiceans. And so they were wealthy. And they were wealthy in many different ways and for many different reasons, but belonging to this wealthy city and sharing in its wealth did not make them rich. So Jesus says, come and buy fine gold. And second, then Jesus counsels them to buy garments. Part of the reason that Laodicea was wealthy is it was a producer of fine wool, specifically black wool, very rare kind of wool. And so it was a sort of clothing capital in the empire. And Jesus says, just because you live in a clothing capital in the empire does not mean that you are not naked before me. I see you and you need to be clothed, not with a black garment, but with a white garment. You need to be clothed with something that indicates, that represents holiness before me. And then third, he says that you need eye salve so that you can see. Laodicea was uh, a clothing capital, but it was also a center of, of medical progress. There was a, a research facility, we might say, in Laodicea. And the Laodiceans had, had developed this eye salve, this ointment, that had medical qualities that could heal people's eyes. And they found local minerals that would be used for this, and so they would export this eye salve to other places. So Jesus addresses them in ways that they would be particularly able to understand. And Jesus says, just because you can fix the eyes in your head does not mean that you can see the truth or that you are seeing the truth. So buy from me gold, buy from me clean garments, buy from me that which makes your eyes truly see. Buy from me the real thing. There was, there was a time in this nation when the currency was backed up by precious metals. So if you had a dollar, you could turn your dollar in and you could get gold in exchange. If you had a coin, it was oftentimes itself made out of some kind of precious metal. And so, for instance, back in uh, the early part of the previous century, your, your money was backed up by silver. The minimum wage in the middle of the 1960s was um, five quarters, the dollar 25. Now, five quarters in our own day gets you a cart out of, the, out of the line at Aldi and maybe a stick of gum. But in those days, those quarters were made of silver, 90% silver. If you melted down Five of those silver quarters today, it would be worth roughly $25. You see, those quarters didn't lose value because they were the real thing. Other currency loses value. In some nations in history, paper money has become so worthless that it is worth more as fuel to heat your home than it is worth to buy something. It's not real once it loses its value. Our own, our own dollar and its strength is dropping rather rapidly compared to other times in the last 30 or 40 years of our nation. And if history tells us anything, it's that one day every nation ends and its currency is worth nothing. But if history tells us anything on the other end, it's that gold and silver will continue to have value. You see, they had the equivalent of paper money Paper money from a nation that would end. It wouldn't help them. It wouldn't help them in the kingdom. It wouldn't help them with Christ. And so he says, you have the fake thing. Come to me and buy the real thing. 
But how? He's just told them that they're poor. He's just told them they don't have anything. How are they going to take what's all counterfeit, what's not really worth all that much, how are they going to take that and come to Him and buy the real thing? Nobody in their right mind gives somebody real gold for paper money that's not worth anything. If I go to the jeweler and I say, I would like that ring, and I bring a whole bunch of the, the little school money that the kids use, it's fake, and I say, here, here uh, this is what I'd like to pay, he's going to look at me and think, I- I'm going to call the police because you're trying to pass counterfeit, or he's going to kick me out for being stupid. How am I going... How am I going to buy the real thing if all I have is the counterfeit? This brings us back to Isaiah 55, verse 1. In Isaiah 55, verse 1, the Lord says this, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. You see, this is grace. There was mercy that Jesus kept speaking to them. This is grace because He gives them what they need without cost. He invites them to come and buy, but really He just invites them to come and to have. Because, and only because, He loves them. Let's turn to verse 19 then. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. He loves them. That's amazing in itself. He loves them. They were lukewarm, wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. They were worthy of being spit out. But He loves them. And it's because He loves them that He writes to them. This brings us back to the proverb. The Lord reproves him whom He loves as a father, the son in whom He delights. Out of love, he calls them to vigor. That's what he wants. He wants vigor. He wants zeal. One commentator said that zeal is a necessary component in love for God. True love for God has zeal. We're, I would suspect anyways, most of us zealous for something. People are zealous for different things. Some people may be zealous for their family. Some people zealous for music, sports, maybe a special someone. I think recently we've become increasingly zealous for our side in the culture war, for our own political purposes. But above all other things, Christ would have us be zealous for the gospel. Not to lose, as he said in the past, to lose our first love. They lacked zeal. They lacked vigor. And so he calls them to come and repent. And this is, this is something that I want for you. I want it for myself, yes. But I, I want it for you. And, and there are a number of things, because in just a few short weeks, after eight and a half years, our relationship, at least in this way, will be over. And, and so there are a number of things that I desire for you in your next pastor. Just one of those things, just one of those things, is I want him to be given of God the ability to inspire you to zeal. To inspire you to serve the Lord with greater energy And that is not a critique of you as though you lack energy. It is simply a statement. I desire for him to be able to inspire you to zeal. Now, how he does that, I I don't particularly care. But just that he does that, that is a desire for me to see this church continue and to grow in strength and zeal and love for Christ and for our community. And so let's move on to verse 20. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Knocking is meant to gain attention. It's not like Jesus is outside in the cold begging them to let him in so that he can come and warm up. He's just knocking at the door 
so that they will hear him, and he expects them to come and answer. If somebody knocks on your door and you know that they're knocking, and you just let them keep knocking without acknowledging that they are there, it's it's very rude and oftentimes quite foolish. And so Jesus says, I stand at your door and I knock, and I expect you to answer. And if you do, if you do, then I will come in and I will eat with you. I will commune with you. I will have renewed fellowship with you. And we will have a renewed relationship. This is a great benefit. Open the door. Hear the voice. Listen to the words. Gain a vigor. And then commune with Christ. That's the immediate benefit. And then we go on into verse 21 into what we might say is the ultimate final benefit. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. To the one who conquers as he conquered. Jesus had every reason to call it quits. He was staring down the barrel, we might say, of suffering, both in body and in soul, that had never been and will never be experienced again. He knew what was coming. He knew what was coming. Who who would have blamed him? Who would have blamed him for walking away? But he was zealous for the gospel that he was given to accomplish. And so he suffered, and in suffering and in death he conquered. Isn't that a great irony? Isn't it a great irony that in his crucifixion he conquered? And so it is, and so it is with all who belong to him. Those who endure as he endured those who are willing to undergo suffering as he suffered and come out the other side with faith, with endurance and perseverance, they too will conquer as he conquered. One commentator, Greg Beale, he said it rather simply, if they overcome the same temptations to compromise their faithful witness that Jesus overcame, They will be granted a ruling position in the messianic kingdom just as Jesus was given by his Father. Conquer. Endure. Be willing to suffer, to be an outsider for the sake of Christ. I had a a conversation this last week, and I'll, I'll close with this. I had a really sweet conversation with a child this last week a child came to me and asked me a simple question. Will, will people make fun of us if we tell them about Jesus? I said, maybe. She said, well, well that's, that's sad. I said, yeah, but do you think it's worth it? She said, what do you mean? I said, well, if we tell ten people about Jesus, nine of them make fun of us, and one of them believes, do you think that was a good idea? And she said, yeah. Because otherwise she wouldn't know Jesus. That's the heart of a victor. And that's what we should desire. Let's pray. Lord, you speak to us again and again and again, saying, Let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And Lord, your Spirit has spoken to us very plainly through these words today. That we are to have a zeal, a vigor, and that we ought to take every measure to make sure that we are not those who will be vomited out. As you vomited the Israelites out of Canaan for their unfaithfulness, do not do the same for us. But save us from our lethargy. 
prevent us from being apathetic. Instead, inspire in us zeal. Some of us once had it and we have lost it. Perhaps others of us never had it in the first place. And some have it and need to keep it. And so wherever it is that we are, that we are in our lives right now, those who've lost it, those who've never had it, or those who need to keep it, we ask that you would fill us with your Spirit so that we would be zealous and we would have vigor and a desire not only for ourselves to know you, but as well for others. And we ask that you would, you would speak not only to us, but through us, that we would again, as you have said, be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And so as we have heard the word, we remember the words of the Apostle James who says that we ought not to be hearers of the word only, but doers also. So Lord, we we pray for that. And even as next Sunday we enter into Advent, Lord, and we leave behind these letters with all their encouragement and their convictions. We ask that the big picture, the main point, which is to be faithful, which is to be willing to suffer embarrassment or ostracism, and which is that there is great reward for those who are faithful to the end. Let these stick in our minds just perhaps for a few weeks, but may these stick in our minds for our lives, leading us to endure and to conquer and to receive the victor's crown at the end. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.